Here we go. So, yes, the talk is heading for extinction and what to do about it. So, I'd just like to acknowledge that where I am, I'm meeting you via my room on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the sovereignty has not been ceded, that we're on stolen land and they have been rebelling these last 200 years and also trying to um, fa um, stave off extinction. So, I'm guessing that you are tuned in tonight because you're not like these guys. They're playing golf as the fire comes down the hill and that's a classic example of people ignoring the emergency that's all around them. So at the moment we have basically three emergencies around us, obviously the virus, obviously the climate and also the ecological emergency. So part one today is tell the truth. What is the truth about how serious things are? Part two is if you accept that it really is that bad, what would you do? How would you act? And part three is actually the rationale for civil disobedience. So I hope you're all staying for at least an hour because the talk goes basically down the emotional slide for half an hour to the depths of depression and despair and then up to the other side. Um, the whole topic is really quite an emotional one. So it's a process where all sorts of feelings can arise. Um, so it's good to actually spend some time connecting with some of the other audience members, even though we're in this strange Zoom world. So this is where we're going to do our first practice of the breakout rooms. Um, we're going to put you into breakout rooms just for literally two minutes with four other people. That gives you 30 seconds each to say in one sentence while you're here. Sorry, look, I think we'll give you three minutes. There you go, three minutes. But just really briefly, who you are, where you're from, and what makes you want to tune into this really depressing sounding talk. There we go. Okay, so this is me, um, and this is why I'm here. Um, so for a long time, I was just one of those people who cared in a general kind of way about the environment. But I thought really other people were taking care of the problem. I knew there was this thing about climate change, but I thought that it was being taken care of. Technology would solve it. Uh, so this is me. The two boys are mine. The other two are other, somebody else's. Um, I was focusing on just being a, being a psychologist, being a mum, until someone invited me along to a talk. It was a Darabin Climate Action Now talk, in fact. And at that talk, I saw this graph. And the thing about it, this was 2007. The thing about it was that, that red line was, was what was happening in the Arctic. And, and this was the average of what the scientists thought would happen. The black line and the blue area is all the different predictions, you know, that, from other scientists. And the thing that struck me was that the things that were happening in the Arctic were happening just so much faster than anyone had thought. And if I hadn't been a psychologist, I was going to be a mathematician. Graphs don't speak to everyone, but they spoke to me. What, they said, what this one said to me was that it's, it's going exponential. And so I got involved with Darab and Climate Action Now, and I got onto this mailing list, which was um, from Philip Sutton and David Spratt, and they were writing a submission to the Garno Inquiry way back then, um, which was in the process of turning into a book because what had happened is as they started to research to write the submission, they had discovered that it was an emergency. They discovered it was very, very serious. And so they then started writing a book which, they, which eventually became Climate Code Red. Um, and because I was on the mailing list, I was receiving the chapters as they wrote them one by one. And each one, of course, was more horrifying than the one before. That Already things in 2007 were very, very serious. And it was quite scary and difficult reading that. But the thing that was more scary to me was to see in one of the things that they wrote that they were in these scientist chat rooms and the scientists already in 2007 were talking about, should we buy land in Tasmania? Should we buy land in New Zealand? How can we keep our families safe? And that was really the thing. It was that actual personal account of the scientists' responses that persuaded me, this is really serious. I better get involved. So I did. I got involved with the Arab and Climate Action Now. We ran all sorts of campaigns. Um, 
And in the climate emergency section of the climate movement at that time, we recognised that the critical decade for getting to zero emissions was between 2010 and 2020. So beyond zero emissions was just falling. And our interpretation, our view of what the scientists were saying is that we had 10 years to get to zero finishing this year. We were meant to be there. If we didn't want things to happen, like the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, um, the ice-free Arctic melting of the Antarctic, melting of Greenland, things like that. Well, we tried our best as our all sorts of quite a few um, climate emergency groups, but we never really, well, we didn't win, obviously. So halfway through that decade, I was recognising that time was running out. That, so that's when I quit my salaried regular job. And I went into semi-retirement. I still do some private practice. But from 2005, 2006, I um, started just working as much as close to full time as I could on climate emergency work. And as a psychologist, one of the things that interested me, well, partly because we were up against this problem of not being able to get the message out, it was the question of messaging. Why was the message not getting out? Some of it was clear, like there was a, obviously a very well organised and orchestrated campaign of straight out lies. That was very clear to see. There was the problem that scientists were sort of reticent and very um, unemotional in their language and a lot of people didn't understand from what scientists said that it really was that serious. But the bit that interested me was actually the problem I thought with the messaging from our side and it came to a head around a, an article that David Wallace Wells wrote in 2018. It was called The Uninhabitable Earth. It was in the New York magazine where he was deputy editor and in it he tried to just explain in really emotional terms um, the whole climate emergency. And, but to put it in ordinary language, to say it was really, really serious and to explain we were heading for an uninhabitable earth. And within days it had two million views, it was hitting a spot in the public interest um, and awareness. But within, again, days, he was getting this terrible barrage of attack from within the climate movement and even climate scientists saying that this was disaster porn, that this was um, going to scare people and make them go to denial. And the main thing that people were saying, and I was saying it over and over again, was fear doesn't work. And this had been around in the climate movement for years and years and years. Through that whole decade of us trying to get the emergency message up, we had opposing voices saying fear doesn't work. Now, I'm actually with David Wallace Wells because it does not seem plausible to me that the risk of scaring people too much is a problem. The biggest risk is not scaring them enough. But I literally stood up at a, at a, um, and asked a question at a, a conference where scientists were speaking in Canberra about drawdown. And it was a fairly depressing conference. They were talking about how it was going to be quite difficult and how as you started to draw, draw, draw down from the atmosphere, more was going to go up. And I stood up at one point and I said, do you think it's time to tell people it's an emergency? But they literally, from the, the person who was chairing from the stage, said, oh, no, 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 fear doesn't work. We, we're not going to tell them how serious this is. Anyway, fortunately, David well, Wallace Wells has continued to try and put the word out. His article is now a book. But it set me looking at the research. And the fact is that it's just completely not true. There's meta-analysis of messaging in the public health sphere, which shows very clearly that fear works. The most effective message in the public health sphere is a personally relevant threat, something that can happen to you and the action you need to take to avoid it. That's why we have these really disturbing cigarette packages. Um, but when you look at emergency messages, you know, what sort of message should you give if a really dangerous fire is approaching Geelong? There's no research. Why is that? It's because there is no debate, no debate whatsoever that the most effective and the only reasonable message to give if a fire is approaching you along is to tell people about the fire, how bad it is, where it is, how fast it's moving, whether they should stay or whether they should go. Um, and if the northern road's blocked, you tell them you've got to go by the southern road. And it doesn't really matter how catastrophic or bad the fire is. It doesn't drive people into denial. 
if they know that what they need to do is leave by the southern road. Even if the threat is really scary and it's almost, there's almost no hope of escape, they will tend to still keep trying as long as they know that the threat is a life and death threat, a very real emergency. So we've seen this again in the coronavirus. We would not have seen the kind of shutdowns and major, major disruption of our society unless governments had said very clearly well, our government anyway, that this is an emergency. This is a life and death matter. And I don't think people would have been prepared to go ahead with all the sacrifices that we've made unless they had been hearing the stories of the doctors from Italy saying, look, we're having to make decisions about leaving people to die in the corridor. It was the story about the threat and the action to take, socially, social distancing, that persuaded people to embrace social distancing. So, emergency message. Threat and the action to take. There is no debate that this is the most effective form of message in an emergency. So, you have a choice of evoking fear. In terms of our campaigning, we can actually also use anger. That's also an activating emotion that drives all the campaigns that have ever happened, really, for social justice. We don't want guilt. That's what packaging companies used to campaign against um, container deposits, they make it into an individual problem. Keep America Beautiful was a campaign they backed, which became as Keep Australia Beautiful. And in those campaigns, it's all about your individual guilt for littering. If you didn't litter, we wouldn't have a problem with too much plastic containers. So guilt is um, takes people and makes them want to stay home and hide in, on the couch. It does not activate them. And similarly, despair, saying that it's all hopeless is not going to activate anybody. So the form of treatment that I was working on was called acceptance and commitment therapy. And it was all about getting in touch with your values, the things that are absolutely most important, most important to you, that you want to be remembered for, that you want your life to be about. And that connecting with those and taking action on those is actually the thing that can lift people out of anxiety, lift people out of depression. It's the thing in the end that makes all of us the most happy. It's not things, you know, it's not going out, or it's not a whole lot of things like that. It's doing the things that are most important to us. And anyway, values-based action is great. Values-based action with others is one of the most satisfying things that we can do, even if it's hard. So, what we're trying to do with Extinction Rebellion and with emergency messaging more generally is shift this thing that's called the Overton window. And it's, the Overton window is represented in this by this purple square in the centre. The, the centre, the sensible centre, what's perceived as the sensible centre as the views of ordinary people is the arena in which policy is made. And if you use strong messaging, you can shift what's seen as normal. And what has happened with the fossil fuel industry and the various other people who have been trying to oppose action is that they have come out early with a very strong message that the climate's always changing, it's a hoax, scientists are lying, they've got vested interests, shouldn't believe them. And by virtue of their very strong messaging, they have managed to shift the idea of what is what should have been unthinkable, which was unthinkable somewhere back in the early 2000s, to being quite inside the realm of normality. So now we have, for example, on, on Q&A, we have scientists debating climate change deniers because they've managed to shift the Overton window. Now, as a grassroots climate emergency activist, we were trying to shift the window, but we didn't really have the traction in terms of our messaging and our capacity to get the message out. But I think if, if more groups and more of society had joined us way back then in 2007 in saying, look, it's an emergency, we have to declare an emergency, we have to take emergency action, or we are risking human extinction. If we had gone hard with that message 10 years ago, I think we'd be a lot further forward now. We've been going pretty hard on it, really, the last couple of years, especially Extinction Rebellion and the school kids strike. Greta Thunberg is very good at this. And we're already seeing that window shift. So 
how do we tell a story that shifts that open window? One thing that I'm going to try and remember to do, and I would like you to remember to do, is to always say climate emergency, not climate change. The Guardian has shifted its language and it really makes such a difference to how you read the stories. When you say climate change, you're actually spreading that denier meme, the climate is always changing. And part of the reason that they pushed to have that language used by the Republicans in the United States is because they already knew that when you say climate change, people are less concerned and less likely to act than even if you say global warming. Now, climate emergency is one step more, more intense than global warming. So shifting the language is a simple step that everyone can take from now. And there's people like Banky Moon that have been using this emergency language since 2007. It's just a pity there haven't been more leaders, especially. So this is the booklet uh, that I wrote. Don't mention the emergency. It's got all the, the psychology research about emergency messaging, but it's also got a summary of the science re research because I'll be going through it quickly now. I won't be going through all the references, but there's enough references to make a solid case that are in, in that booklet, which you can download from free for free. So the first point in making the case for emergency action is that the earth is already too hot. You hear talk about you know, a two, two degree guardrail or can we stay under 1.5 degrees and 1.5 degrees, it's so much better than two degrees, but it can't be that great because we're at 1.1 degrees of warming now and things are not great now. It's a very confusing message. It's one of the ways that the, the public has been misled in a way into not acting because we're talking about 1.52. It's like it, the problem is all in the future. So the important thing to know is that the earth is already too hot. It's already got all these big problems. And the other thing about it is that we're already, even at 1.1 degrees of warming, which is just here, right? We're outside the, the climate zone in which the whole of human civilization has happened. This is organized and settled human civilization. From the development of agriculture through to the industrial revolution, we were actually heading slightly down in temperature. Now we've zoomed up to 1.1. And does, does two degrees look that safe to you? And some people say, oops, we'll get to four degrees before the end of the century. So what we're seeing, of course, you know, is unprecedented droughts, unprecedented fires, billions of animals dying in that, one billion animals dying in the fires over summer, sea level rises, this is in Kiribati, extreme weather, this is in the Bahamas. And as well as all the disruption to the climate systems, there's the impact on people. And there's been tens of thousands of people dying in heat waves in Europe. And we don't even know how many people die in the heat waves in Asia. This is in Pakistan in 2015. They're not just dying from heat waves, they're dying from famines that come out of droughts. They're dying from water that's running out. And at the moment, there's this terrible locust plague happening in Kenya. Like with all the virus news, you don't even really have to get to hear about it. But between the disrupted supply lines and the locust plague and the drought and all the other things that have been happening in Africa, there's going to be millions in a state of famine in coming months. So I don't think any of you will probably be in any doubt that that the earth is already too hot. There are so many examples that I could give. But let's move on to the second point because the second point is it's not just that it's too hot. It's not just that things are bad now. It's that we're heading towards the point of no return. So in the same way as if you're paddling down a stream and you make a mistake and don't paddle over to the bank and there's a waterfall up ahead, you can end up leaving it too late. You notice the waterfall, you paddle for the bank and you might make it, that means you weren't at the point of no return, or you might start paddling and you might not make it, and you might get to the tipping point where you're going actually over the edge of the waterfall. But once you're halfway down the waterfall, there's going to be, there's definitely no way back. So with temperature, at one degree of warming, we've already got some momentum in the system, some warming momentum. By two degrees, we'll have more. 
and by three or four, we're in free fall going down the waterfall. The problem is that same as with the river, we don't exactly know where that point of no return is. But the problem is this momentum. So we're seeing things where we have current warming, but that current warming is going to cause more warming. So as the ice melts in the Arctic, methane is bubbling up from, from the thawed permafrost and from the thawing seabed. And then, of course, methane is that horribly intense greenhouse gas. So the methane is released, it heats the Arctic more, more methane is released, and it's one of those vicious circles. There's so many of them. The other thing that is very, very serious is the things that we're disrupting that we have no idea how to reverse. And one of these is the ocean currents. So as Greenland has begun melting and making a, a cold blob of, of fresh water up near Greenland, it's slowing down the ocean currents. And this is something that Professor Stefan Ramsdorf said we should avoid at all costs. But anyway, it's happening, it's happening. It's only happening to a relatively small extent so far. But it's one of those things, we have actually no idea how to reverse, how to reverse it. So it's an example of a very serious and accelerating changes that we're already starting off. Again, I won't go through heaps of them. We'll just come to a summary by one of the most eminent scientists in the world. So this is Hans Schellenhuber, advisor to Angela Merkel, advisor to the European Union, founder of the Potsdam Institute. And his summary is that we're reaching the end game and that very soon we have to choose between taking unprecedented action. Unprecedented, not even in wartime, the kind of action we have never seen before or accepting it's been left too late and bear the consequences. And he says the issue is the very survival of our civilization. So we don't need to go through the science, I think, one bit by one bit. The important thing is this overview where at the point where we take unprecedented action or it will be too late. That's what one of the most eminent scientists in the world is telling us. And a more detailed, that's an opinion. This is a study. And Will Stefan, Hans Schellen, Huber and a number of others did a study looking at the risk of tipping off, of setting off a cascade of tipping points, a cascade of feedbacks. And they're not saying it will happen between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees of warming, but they're saying that well, they can't exclude it. We could be past the point of no return even before we reach 2 degrees of warming. And staying under 2 degrees, like sometimes you hear it talked about in the media, so it's going to be easy. It's going to be exceptionally difficult. And many people, many scientists will say that the chance of staying under 1.5 degrees now is almost zero. So 1.5 degrees of warming. So this is... Um, a 3D graph of the waterfall and what you can see is up the top there um, that we had a planet that was relatively stable in terms of its climate and we've destabilized it so we're now in this sort of channel it's like we're heading for a waterfall and the danger is that we go past this planetary threshold here and that we basically over the waterfall and heading towards a hot house, an earth that is largely or possibly completely uninhabitable. But, oopsie daisy, ah. um, but we're still up the, up the top here. If we paddle hard for the shore, we can possibly still stabilize it again. So it's like paddling hard for the shore with the waterfall. But we've got to do it now. If we pass the threshold, and that could be before two degrees, then it's too late. So. The third thing that Extinction Rebellion adds to the mix is that it's not just a climate emergency. It actually is an ecological emergency as well. So there's things that are to do with the climate, like the bleaching of the reef. There's things like the bats falling out of the sky because the weather is so hot. There's things like the dying of the giant kelp forests down in Tasmania, which we can't see, but are, are home to just massive amount of, of wildlife under the sea. This is actually to do with heating. But we're doing other things like wiping out animal species with deforestation. We're in the midst of what scientists are calling the sixth mass extinction. So we're actually having species go extinct as fast now under our influence as happened in those past mass extinctions with the dinosaurs and so on. 
also we have we're facing an insect apocalypse so this is partly to do with our pesticide use again it's not all climate but it's another way that we're pushing our own survival to the limit now sometimes people say oh well you know the people will die but it doesn't really matter the, you know nature will survive it'll be better for nature at the moment we're pushing nature towards a mass extinction as well and in the past those mass extinctions have taken millions of years two to ten million years for nature to recover from the one at the permian triassic period so david attenborough is in touch with nature and um his summary is we cannot be radical enough in dealing with the issues that face us it's another way of putting the same thing we're running out of time we can't mess around so one of the controversial things that extinction rebellion talks about but so does breakthrough institute and david spratt and ian dunlop and crew here in melbourne is could humans become extinct now we know already we can look around the world and we can see already the food shortages we can see the water shortages and we can see that they're contributing to conflicts and mass migration they're not the only cause but they're a contributing factor we can see nations building walls this is one in that india has built around bangladesh there's 80,000 troops patrolling there's they shoot 800 a year of people going over and some people say it's the first climate war. It's there for a number of reasons. Now, why do they need a wall around Bangladesh? It's because those red bits are the low-lying bits of Bangladesh and already salt water is seeping into food growing areas and bits of food growing areas down in that delta are going under. Bangladesh is one of the most at-risk countries and very, very densely populated. This is one of the detention arrangements of the illegal immigrants into America and not all again, but some of those refugees are there because their crops have failed. So one of the crops that's failing in South America these days is the coffee crop. And that's because a, um, a pest that eats the coffee crop used to get killed off by the cold nights. Now there's no cold nights. That means the whole large areas now have no coffee crop, have no way of surviving, and they become refugees. So this is just the start though. This is just the first glimpse of how things might unfold. And again, the, the scientists have been saying this for years. So this is Professor Lonnie Thompson, a paleoclimatologist uh, paleo from 2010. Virtually all of us climatologists are now convinced that global warming poses a clear and present danger to civilization. They've been saying it now for 10 years, at least. And we don't know exactly whether every single person will die, but this is again Professor Sjellen Huber's estimate. He estimates that if we get to four degrees of warming later this century, about 2080, we might get to that, the world can support only about one billion people. Like it might be half a billion, it might be two billion. But what is the process going to be like between now and 2080 as most people, the majority of people, somehow die from one reason or another, from famine, from flood, from extreme weather, but also from wars as things start to break down. This is how the World Bank puts it, which is a bit euphemistic really, but it's their way of saying the same thing. This is part of our problem because a lot of these authorities express it in this sort of language. There is no certainty that adaptation to a four degrees world is possible. What they mean is we can't adapt and we're possibly going to all or most of us or some of us, large numbers of us are going to die. That's what they mean. But when they put it in those words, most people do not realise how serious it is. So I, having heard what the scientists were up to, what was the first thing I did, of course, um, buy some land in Tasmania. It's tempting to look for an individual solution. And I have to confess, I was looking for one um campaigning but as a backstop as a as a, a bolt hole buy some land in tasmania but someone said to me okay you, you're going to buy your land in tasmania are you going to give your kids machine gun lessons too now my kids are 30 now so but the same thing still applies none of us would be that great with a machine gun but if society if civilization if, if organized society breaks down 
the fact that we own the title to land in Tasmania, no one's actually going to care. That's the problem. It's the problem and it's, you could say it's the good news or you can say it's the bad news because people care, as I said at the start, they care about a personally relevant threat. They care about particularly something that's going to affect them. And there's people who care a lot if it's going to affect poor people in another country, but it's not everyone. Whereas 99.9% .9 of people care if it's coming for us. And the thing about the climate and ecological emergency is it is coming for everybody. The poor are already suffering. The poorest and the people who did the least to cause it, they're already suffering. They're already dying in numbers that we don't even count. But in the end, it's coming for us as well. And if people knew how serious it was and that it is coming for us now, soon, all of us, I think that they would be prepared to take emergency action in the same way as they've been prepared to take action on the pandemic. So this is where ideally we're going to break out rooms and, I, and you'd have a chance to talk about your feelings about this. Um, I don't know whether to try it again or not, because, but it's quite important because I think it's a burden to carry, isn't it? to know this very serious material, to know how serious it is, is a burden. And all right, we've, we've, got, some, we've got some votes for trying the breakout rooms. All right, yep. let's, we'll just do it very briefly. Let's okay. Break but the question is, yeah, if you, if you knew all this already, how do you keep going and how do you manage with the emotional burden of it? And if you're just hearing it for the first time, I feel so bad about that, although I think it's a job that has to be done. So how are you coping with just hearing this? You can see now why I want you to stay for the next half hour after. All right, so let's go into breakout rooms for five minutes. I think how short that three minutes was. So it's really just enough to say just in a sentence or two. A couple of sentences that have feeling words in it. How do you feel hearing this? How do you feel knowing this? And then in five minutes, we'll be back again. So anyway, we're onto the uplisting bit now, which is act as though the truth is real. So when we realised back in 20, 2007, 8, 9, 10, that it was an emergency, like we tried to act as though the truth is real, but we just didn't really know what to do. And even up till 2016, when it was 2016 and the reef bleached, we realised this, this was a moment where we had to really sort of do something, that people had woken up, that it really was serious, it was irreversible. And so we launched a petition. It's not really an emergency response, although we did start the council thing as well, and the council thing has gone well. So, but if we were really serious, like if, if large numbers realised it really was this bad, what would emergency action look like? Well, it would look like Extinction Rebellion, in my opinion, and Extinction Rebellion is something that grew out of Rising Up, um, a movement in the United Kingdom, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And it was started really by 15 co-founders that came out of Rising Up. And that included Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook, who you might have heard of. Um, but it included quite a, well, it included at least 13 other people as well. And sometimes you hear that people say, oh, it was so, it's so white and middle class. Well, Roger and Gail both came from working class families. And there's quite a few others actually in the centre of Extinction Rebellion that really get offended by being called white and middle class. It started off really quite diverse, as climate movements go. So it's got three demands. And the first one is tell the truth. And it's tell the truth by declaring a climate and ecological emergency and conveying that it really is that serious. The government has to work with our institutions to tell everyone that it's an emergency. And this is important because what we need is a shift into emergency mode, like we've seen with the pandemic that we have to shift into a whole different way of being, like we do when there's a flood or a fire or a pandemic. You just drop everything else, you focus on what has to be done. You don't worry about how much it's gonna cost because you have to get people to where they're safe. And it brings out usually the best in people, people working together for the greater good. You don't hear when the river's rising and the flood's coming to a town and people are stacking the sandbags you don't hear them going, oh, well, I'm from the right, I'm not going to work on this, or you know, I'm from the left, I'm not going to work on this. 
because when it's life and death, you work together. And that's what we have to some extent seen in, in Australia with the pandemic. The clearer it is that people, for people that it's a life and death threat to us all, the more people will work together, as long as there's some structures and things that bring people together so they work together well. So that's number one. Number two is we need to get to net zero by 2025. This to me is just code for as fast as humanly possible until we have this whole different mentality where we just drop everything and do everything that's needed on the emergency as fast as we can. We don't know how fast we could do it. It might be five years, it might be 10 years, but we have to go as fast as, we, as, we, as humanly possible because the damage that we've already done is terrible. And at any point, it could become irreversible. Any point, today, yesterday, tomorrow, could be that point. So we cannot waste any time. We've also got to look after biodiversity loss and we've got to halt that mass extinction in its tracks. So the things that you hear mainly as solutions are all the things like solar panels and bike tracks and things like that, and doing houses so that they um, can be zero emissions. We don't know at this point in history, now we've left it so late, whether we can do a smooth transition where everything just you know, works out pretty smoothly and we build more solar and everything goes on vaguely the same, or whether it's going to be more like a, a you know, economic crash and a, e, you know, a series of ecological and climate emergencies that we've got to somehow do this transition through. But whether it's bumpy or whether it's smooth, there is no doubt we've just got to do it. We've got to go as fast as we can. We've got to cut the emissions but we've also got to do drawdown. So initially we'll be doing cutting the emissions and doing drawdown simultaneously till we get to net zero. Then, since the Earth's already too hot, we've got to keep going because we've got to get cooler than we are now. And the only way we get cooler than we are now is by taking some of that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it back under the ground. Now there's machines that do that. They're incredibly expensive and not that well tested, but we also have these things that are plants. So that's good. And the positive thing about drawdown is that eminent scientist James Hansen says that if we get to zero very fast, net zero, we can do a large part of the drawdown task to get back to a safe temperature using natural drawdown methods by revegetating, rewilding, doing our agriculture completely differently. Things like this one, which is biochar up the top here, things like growing kelp and then actually dropping it into the bottom of chasms in the sea. There's all sorts of things we can do that are natural and that will can draw down a large part of it if we get a move on. But it, yeah, it's not going to look like just a bit of this and a bit of that and life goes on and we still have our, you know, a new iPhone every second year. It's going to look more like the pandemic where ordinary life just stops and you move into doing all the stuff that you need to do to make this transition happen at a speed and scale never before seen in peacetime. Even in wartime, it hasn't been this fast. But at least in wartime, we know that can be very fast. So if you look at some of those figures, you know, you can see Germany going from spending a quarter of its economy on the war to 70% in four years. USA going from 1% to 42%. If you think it's life and death, then this whole thing about, oh, we can't afford it, just drops out of the picture and you just do whatever it takes. I'm, very, I'm looking forward to seeing some graphs about the spending on the pandemic. It still won't be probably as much as that, but it is quite startling how much has been found to spend on the pandemic within a matter of weeks. So the good thing about those drawdown techniques is that as you rewild and change how you do your agriculture, you actually are also working on the biodiversity problem. So that's number two. Number three is one that I initially could not understand. It's that the government must, government must create and be led by the decisions of a citizens' assembly on climate and ecological justice. I mean, one of the things we are seeing with the pandemic is that in emergency mode, you sometimes get almost like an improvement in democracy, but you also can get a, a deterioration in democracy. And some of these decisions about exactly how we make the transition fast and so it's fair are the kind of ones that governments are going to find hard to make. It's partly because of all the vested interests. So one of the things that Extinction Rebellion says is we've got to get the voice of the ordinary people into the polit political decision-making around the hard decisions. Because what we know is that actually our political system is broken at the moment. 
we had what was just called the climate election, right? But we also had a coal billionaire spending $80 million on influencing the outcome. And we ended up with the guy with the coal, even though two thirds of Australians by late last year believed it was a climate emergency. And I don't know how many of us really vote for all the oil wars and things that we've been part of. We've got a media that's not telling the truth and it actually has an enormous impact on how we view the world. And it's not sort of a recent problem, it's, also, it's one that goes right back in history with colonialisation and again, the, the, the way that that was portrayed to people so that people thought it was all fine. So our political system is actually broken at the moment. And one of the obvious things about that is that the ordinary common sense of ordinary people is not much reflected in political decisions. So there's 99% of us probably that would like to leave a habitable planet for our kids, but it's just not reflected in the political system. There's most people who would agree that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. But here we are, we're headed for infinite growth. Most people recognise that our political system is broken. It's not a matter of getting rid of democracy, it's a matter of having a better democracy. And citizens' assemblies are these strange things, they're a bit like jury duty. So in jury duty, you randomly select people to make a very hard decision, like should this person go to jail for a while or in a long time. Citizens' assemblies are also randomly selected. They're selected so that they represent the demographics of the population. And they're used to break political deadlocks often. So the nuclear waste decision, where they had a nuclear waste dump in South Australia, was um, deliberated on by a citizens' jury. They did abortion law reform and gay marriage in Ireland via a citizens' assembly. They're being used all over the place. And it's because there's a whole lot of stuff that actually ordinary people, using ordinary common sense in a well-held deliberative space, can make decisions on that politicians can't because they've got vested interests, like pressuring them from all sides, plus this fear of not getting re-elected. And there's a whole lot of things that it's just very hard to make a sensible decision on. So citizens' assemblies are a way of getting participatory democracy into the system. So those are the three demands, but of course the devil is in the detail of how we're going to win on these because we've done our petitions and things and we're going a bit too slowly, much too slowly. So one of the things I find most encouraging is that as well as there being climate tipping points where you start off slow and then you get out of control, the same thing can happen in reverse, I think, with social tipping points where you campaign and you campaign and it doesn't seem like you getting anywhere, but then suddenly some spark and off it goes. It's, it's hard to imagine really, isn't it, that Greta was one kid outside the Swedish parliament back in August 2018. One, she was one. The most recent set of school strikes, I think was seven million, somewhere something like that. Even by sort of August, September, October, November, December, like within four or five months already, it was from one person to 20,000. And then another four or five months later, 1.5 million. This is an incredible exponential process. And Extinction Rebellion has been the same. Oh no. <laughs> well, this is, the way to, this is the way to do another thing wrong. I just went accidentally to the end of the whole thing. <laughs> oh dear me. Now you've seen the whole presentation backwards. Okay. Nearly there. Okay, this is school struck again. All right. Yeah, so Greta, as I said, is an absolute master, mistress of um, emergency messaging. I want you to act as though the house is on fire because it is. I mean, this is just the most beautifully evocative emergency message. Now, many movements have been stuck where the climate movement is today. Like the campaigns for civil rights in the US or for women's votes, they're campaigns that, especially women's votes, that probably had a lot of support, but they did the petitions, they did the lobbying, and they just couldn't win. And it wasn't until they did mass civil disobedience that pushed things over the, over the edge to a win. And even then, you'd, you'd have a lot of people saying, oh, oh, those suffragettes, we don't really approve of the things they're doing, they're behaving badly. On the other hand, we agree with their cause. 
This is the idea of Extinction Rebellion. That the people won't always like what we do, but in the end they'll come to say, oh, well, look, we don't like the blocking the roads, but we agree there's a climate emergency and we have to act right now. The idea that one has a moral responsibility to, to disobey unjust laws and that if, if the government is not actually going to protect us from human extinction and the breakdown of society, that we have actually an obligation to, dis, to disobey is one that is, again, acceptable really across the political spectrum. When there's no choice, you have to disobey. Australia, of course, has a rich tradition of civil disobedience. This is the Franklin Dam. Um, the Kimberley Gas Hub. This is Lock the Gate, the Bentley Blockade. And there's research showing that nonviolent resistance works better than violent resistance. If you have a violent resistance, you're more likely to get a dictatorship afterwards than if you have a nonviolent rebellion. It doesn't, it's not guaranteed to work, but it has a reasonable chance of success. And from that study, Erica Chenoweth found that in history, only one to 3% of the population needs to be mobilised to bring about a massive social change. Not always, but the massive social changes have been brought about by really quite a small proportion of the population with the backing of passive backing of others. Now, these figures down the bottom, they, they come from Roger Hallam, who was an organic farmer until the, the changing climate meant that he was going bust. And he then went to London to do a PhD on, on civil disobedience and, and social change. So these figures are sort of his estimates, really. It's actually incredibly hard in Australia to get a million people on the street. And even if you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on the street in one day, often it just doesn't work. It doesn't produce a change. This is what happened with the protests against the Iraq war. But Roger's estimate is that 500 people in jail, which doesn't happen very easily in Australia, or 5,000 people arrested is about the same political pressure as a million people on the street, but much, much easier to arrange. That if you have thousands of people who are willing to be arrested and around 5,000 get arrested, you're in the ballpark of massive social change. But it's just an opinion, it's an estimate. So the, the methodology is like this. This is uh, rising up. This is it's Roger over on the left, spray painting, um, and over on the right you see smoke flares, and you see the the person <laughs> walking past with his mouth open. They specialised and practised a style of civil disobedience that was quite confronting and very visual. This is um, Gail Bradbrook, one of the other co-founders that I mentioned, and this is her outside the Murdoch press during the UK elections and she's spray painted the window and they're videoing. The police are standing by ready to arrest her, but it's only chalk spray. So in the end, she just says to the police, I'd say, okay, I'll clean it off. And they laugh and walk away. And there's a video which went viral and had 150,000 views. That's from one person just coming up with really quite a creative and visual sort of um, act. So in early 2018, a group formed within Rising Up, it was about the climate emergency, but which rapidly took on a life of its own. So that, that's where that's what became then Extinction Rebellion. So during 2018, what they did was they did introductory talks like this, just all over the UK, 60 outreach talks, and building towards a date in October. So they were telling people, we're going to get on the streets in October. Are you willing to get arrested? I want you to sign up. I want your commitment. So I set mobilisation date. And when people committed and said, yes, I'm willing to risk arrest, they would get into small groups wherever they were in their local neighbourhood and they just practice getting on the streets. The point of these is not so much the disruption, it's to practice and get your confidence up. So this is just a group of 10 or 20 people just blocking a street for quite a short period, getting ready to go to London in October. So in October, they told the UK Parliament that unless they declared an emergency, they were going to rebel. Greta came down to launch it. But of course, by November, the UK government had not declared an, uh, an emergency. So at that point, they had about 6,000 people willing to risk arrest, or at least willing to get on the bridge for a while. So they blocked off five bridges in London. They only were there for two or three hours. There was about 70 arrests. So that was the beginning of the rebellion. 
So they kept on going then with other actions. They joined in with getting councils to declare a climate emergency and they did some actions that put pressure on the City of London and they declared an emergency that was just shortly after in December. They did some, again, very visual, um, high impact, emotional style actions like this one, which is Light About Children, which is using completely non-toxic um, blood-like liquid but it's symbolising that our children will die unless we act, which is a very strong message. 24 people willing to be arrested. In fact, in the end, nobody was arrested, but front page of The Guardian. And they were working up to April. Now, in April, by April, the rebellion had spread all around the world to 70 countries. Again, this exponential growth. Well, not all 70 did a rebellion in April, but quite a few did. But by April, in the UK, they had enough people to hold five locations in London for 11 days, 11 days, not 5,000 arrests, but they had 1,000 arrests. Um, and part of the way they held the streets was things like this peak boat. So it was sort of stage as well, so that there's people coming and listening and atmosphere of fun, entertainment. And as the police would move in to try and tow away the peak boat, people would come, people, people willing to risk arrest, and would glue their hands on it. So in fact, it was very hard to move. And it took days and days for the police to work out how to actually remove the pink boat. This is partly how they managed to hold the streets for 11 days. One of the things Extinction Rebellion does is it really tries to involve a whole range of people, including people from all walks of life and including some people who are unusual. Because that's how you convey that you are the 99% and that's how you get the 99% to come and join you. And treating the police too as, as human beings, because again, that's how you get the 99% to come and join you. If you're rude and nasty and aggressive, you won't get people coming to join you. So in, in the block bridges, it was also fun, the, the skate rink, um, skateboarding rink. There's a lot of very beautiful artwork and props that are part of Extinction Rebellion. This is the Red Rebels that now replicated all around the world in a lot of cities. And the aim inside Extinction Rebellion is to really create the kind of society that we want to see, where people are looked after, where decision-making is done by um, a system that is much more democratic than um, egalitarian, where the hierarchies are not so marked and where participation is easy. And it's a, another, surprise, me, another surprising thing is how family-friendly some of these spaces are, even though these are arrestable actions. Obviously, the bit where the kids are is not the arrestable bit, but it's all part of the same um, overall action. This was after the April Rebellion. This, again, was another very daring and um, visual act, which I heard about driving my car to work um, in Melbourne. So this was just 13 people. They stripped off to semi-naked. This, this guy's being the elephant in the room. That's his ears. And they're in the Brexit debate which was a completely obsessing England, of course, um, UK for months and years. So they're in the Brexit debate and they're calling out, you're wasting our time, we're going to die. Again, a very simple and very evocative message. So there was 13 of them, they did get arrested. But it was something that was heard of all across the world, even into Melbourne. So the idea is that we go to the centre of a city ideally the capital city, it's harder in Australia, shut down the city for as long as we can and it's posing the authorities with a dilemma. Either they leave us there for one day, two days, five days, 10 days, 11 days, 12 days, how long are they going to leave us there? Or they start trying to clear us off. And if they at any point overreact, then it actually will tend to backfire and more people will come to join us. So this is an example of a backfiring action. It's not here, but it's um, in Paris. And so these people are really quite a small group sitting down on a bridge. And you can see that people have been given the chance to move back. So these people have taken the chance to move off. And these people have voluntarily stayed, even though presumably it's reasonably clear what's going to happen, which is that they're getting sprayed with pepper spray. So because they're obviously peaceful and the authorities are overreacting, this actually tends to build a movement. So what we've seen is this tweet by Greta which got seven, got 4,760,000 views, which was about this event where the people got pepper sprayed. 
the thing about it is that you're showing courage, like you're showing that you think that it's that serious, that you're willing to get pepper sprayed to get the message out. And it's partly this courage of the protesters that brings other people along. But like I said, you have to behave like respect or they won't come and join you. People who get pepper sprayed who are in the process of, you know, shouting at the police, spitting at the police, wrestling with the police, no one comes and joins them, not very many anyway. So the idea is that we behave with respect. It's not requiring that everyone feels respect, especially if they've had a bad experience with the police. You know, we recognise there's Indigenous deaths in custody and it's not like every police person behaves well. But we make a tactical decision for us to always behave peacefully and always behave with respect, regardless of how we feel. So this person is actually in New Zealand and they've, what they've done here is they've shut off the water supply to the water department and they're locked on over there under the green banner. And I don't know exactly what she's saying, but a typical Extinction Rebellion thing to say is, look, I recognise you're doing your job, I'm just doing mine. I'm trying to save the planet for your kids too. So I like to think that's what she's saying with her hands out like that. So yeah, it's a decentralised movement and it has um, a decentralised structure called the self-organising system. And that has, is partly what's enabled it to spread all around the world. You couldn't run 70 countries from one little centralised place in UK. So we are a self-organising system. In Australia, we run our own system, but within the principles and within the demands of the Extinction Rebellion that's all around the world. So in Australia, this was one of our early actions. This is a banner drop at the footy, where the most challenging bit was getting these enormous banners. You wouldn't believe how big they are when they folded up even, through a very thorough bag search at the door. But anyway, we got them in and there they are. This was a die in, in Burke Street in Melbourne. And our first really big rebellion in Melbourne was the next wave of international rebellion, which was in October last year. And again, we tried to involve some unusual suspects. So these were a group of people meditating. And every day we had a meditation event. We had Red Rebels. And we didn't have enough people. We were at the stage, really, in terms of the development of, of our rebellion, that we were about the same size as when the UK did the bridges. So what we tried was for a whole week, we camped um, near the exhibition buildings. And each day we would disrupt the streets for one, two, three hours with large numbers of arrests. But not all the actions were arrestable. This was just a parade through some of the city streets with a coffin, with coral. This was a semi-nude walk through the city. But it illustrates this thing that makes Extinction Rebellion different, I think. It's just that we're so friendly and vulnerable. We're offering ourselves in a vulnerable sort of way. And what we find is people really coming to meet us, you know, really wanting to take our stuff if we're doing a march. So this was here, a rebel who was part of the march, handing out an underwear shop. I thought it was such a great moment. And we finished off the week with some civil disobedience. And again, this is another amazing Melbourne thing that's gone viral all around the world. So this was disrupting the streets, but we were dancing to a very beautifully choreographed version of staying alive. Yes, yeah, so no, no, all around the world, cities have done that kind of disruption. So it's this mixture of really quite courageous and difficult action with fun and, and a really nice feeling of connection. And sometimes people say, oh, well, aren't you just making all the motorists cross by disrupting the streets? Well, this was a, a very critical article that was in The Age about commuters being furious about a, the disruption we'd caused. This is part of the way through the week. But out of a poll of 135,000 people, age readers though, 84% actually supported our protests. Not, not just 84% saying there's an emergency, but 84% 84% supported what we were doing, which is really quite extraordinary, considering we were being quite a pain in the neck. So straight after our disruption came three climate emergency declaration motions. I don't know how many you heard of. Two went to the lower house and one went to the Senate. The lower house ones were narrowly defeated. The Senate one was drawn, but that's not enough to get it up. We saw Labor massively shift their position. They were in the process of reviewing their policies and maybe weakening them following their election defeat. But they, in the process of this 
um, of bringing these emotions, emotions to the parliament. They were, well, particularly Mark Butler, putting out these tweets saying Labor will declare a climate emergency. It was an enormous and sudden shift, and I cannot see anything that prompted it, really, with the exception of our wave of rebellion. We've been struggling ever since 2016 to get to our 100,000 petition on the climate emergency, but straight after the um, October rebellion, there was a petition that went to Parliament with 400,000 signatures that they received only over a matter of weeks. So we're seeing, this, we're seeing a big shift in the Overton window through disruptive civil disobedience. So this is where we'll let you have a proper discussion. Um, Oh dear, it's getting late though. Um, but yeah, in theory this goes till 9.30, right? How, quickly say in the chat, I think if we give you 10 minutes for discussion and then we'll have some questions, how about that? So 10 minutes in the breakout groups. Breakout you, rooms. You can, you can express an opinion if you want longer or shorter, but do it now. Um, but we'll try and make sure you get 10 minutes. Because the question is, like this, if you knew Hitler was coming, what would you be prepared to do to stop all the things that happened from what Hitler did? If you know, like, I don't know, I, I hope that you accept what I'm saying, that, that it really is going to be that serious. This is hundreds of millions. This is billions of people who are going to die. And possibly the whole of everything that we've built up through the whole of organised society is going to be destroyed. What are you willing to do? And it's, you know, it's natural. My natural tendency is to leave it to someone else. And my natural tendency was to not want to get arrested because I'm a psychologist. I knew I'd have to defend my registration. So my first thought is, oh, well, maybe someone else can do it. But look, my second thought is, really, what is going to matter in this period? When I look back, what will I want to be able to say? And I'm going to want to be able to say I did everything that I could. So anyway, this period of discussion is just for you to mull over whether there's some way you can contribute and help. Like, it's not like everyone has to get arrested in the Extinction Rebellion. For every person who gets arrested, there's 10 or 20 that help just by making flags or doing social media. It doesn't have to be with Extinction Rebellion. There are other things you can do. But what's the most you can do? What's the most you're prepared to do to try and save us from this multi-emergency combination? So we've got a question along the line of, of it's all about the money, follow the money uh, is, uh, and people get people to stop spending on the things that are, that we don't like, and that will change life. And, and from another angle, isn't it better to donate money to support causes like solar farms, batteries, etc.? Okay. So look, I think it's true. Like people have been running very good campaigns on divestment and all sorts of um, attempts to shift the money in various ways. And they're absolutely great campaigns. But the thing is, we've run out of time. So I think we have to supplement them. Like, we have to keep shifting our money, no, no doubt about that. We have to supplement them with civil disobedience. And so I would really like you to give your money to, to Extinction Rebellion because I think, well, shift your money to a different fund as well. But if you can spare a donation for Extinction Rebellion, us sitting in the streets and blocking the traffic is going to really amplify the effects of you shifting your money. And what Got a very, <laughs> very practical question for you, Jane. If you get arrested, do you end up with a police record that will affect your travel prospects if you ever want to travel? Um, I think it can affect your travel prospects to the US. Um, so I can't promise you that it won't. But it probably won't. It won't I think even with the US, they don't keep you out, but uh, you have to go through a bit of a process to get a visa while well, they ch just check you didn't get your conviction for, you know, drug or violence, drugs or violence or something like that. So look, it can affect you. On the other hand, I think to me, it's, it's like, you know, in the Vietnam War, there was the conscientious objectors and for a while they had the police chasing them and, you know, if they got caught, they were going to jail. But several years later, when people said, look, really, was that really a just war? Maybe we shouldn't have been there. They were the heroes and they had all their convictions squashed. Yeah. So in this point in history, like it might cause you some inconvenience to have a conviction. On the other hand, when you look back, when you care that you had some inconvenience in terms of where you could travel, or will you care that you were part of this great movement that changed the whole of human history? So there's no guarantees. 
it can cause you some inconvenience. I did actually have a conviction from when I was at uni, which I went through my entire career as a psychologist having to confess every time I went for a job. And really it did me no, it caused me no problems at all. Yeah. Thank you. Josie had a question from her group, I think. I'm just going to see if I can find Josie on my scroll down list of people here and get her to ask it herself. Oh, I'm here. Oh, you're here. I thought you I had you muted. You've managed uh, to unmute yourself. Good. I did, Pro probably because I'm special that way. Um, <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, so our group, uh, we had a, a farmer involved in our group who was talking about um, the action that, that he's taking and with some other people um, to put carbon back into the soil. So take it out of the air and put it back into the soil, which was lovely. And uh, so I was wondering whether you were looking at, because we were talking about how um, it would be good to get those kind of really respected grassroots sectors to help to lead the way to um, influencing um, this situation. So we were wondering whether you had any um, thing going on in, to um, bring those kind of sectors on board in significant ways. Well, the broader climate movement has all sorts of efforts to reach out. You know, there's farmers for climate action, and there's all sorts of efforts to try and you know organise the regenerative farmers and all that sort of thing. When Lock the Gate won the gas ban in Victoria, it was literally they decided that the final thing that kicked the government over was. Farmers are going to ride up Burke Street on their horses, and then they they, they, they put um, a ban on fracking. So yeah, my dream is for Extinction Rebellion. We don't need every farmer; we just need half a dozen or a dozen to ride up the main street on their horses or on their tractors, and it would be enormously effective. It's the same thing. We don't need every farmer on board, but if we could find one or two percent of farmers that would help us out, it would be enormously effective. So we have Extinction Rebellion groups in a lot of country towns. And again, it's not everyone's cup of tea, not everyone comes to join the Extinction Rebellion group. But yeah, country people are really important because they are influential, influential with the conservative side of politics. Anyone else? Um, Jane, can I, I've unmuted myself, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, it's Marianne, um, I'm just wondering, since we locked down, What's Extinction Rebellion sort of planning for the next few weeks or months? So, yes, things are different since the virus, but we are doing stuff. There you go. Right. Like I said, it shows that we can make big changes fast and we've got a big opportunity. So, one of the things we're doing, and the UK, in fact, stay, stay tuned for the news in, in the United Kingdom. They're, they're starting to paint the streets tonight, their time. So, in about a day time, you know, in 12 hours or so here. And what they're going to do is they're going to print posters. And in the UK, the government is already bailing out some of the fossil fuel companies. And they're going to stick giant posters while they exercise on the side of their exercise route. They're going to go past in the night and, and stick a giant poster over the join of the doors of these companies. But in the morning, they actually have to break the poster to get into the building. And they're going to just put it all over social media. So... That's one thing. That's what they're doing in the UK. And the meeting that, that almost made me late for this talk was Paint the Streets in Australia. So we're looking at similar stuff in Australia. And it involves just stenciling and postering. Exactly what the stenciling and postering will target is still to be decided. We'll put, the aim at this point is to, to keep ourselves safe, to stick inside the, the laws um, about public health, but to still do some disruption. And... As soon as we can, you know, be out on the streets in any form, we'll probably be doing things like people have been doing in protests in other countries where you actually, one, one country, they did just lines in the square, you know, six feet apart and then lined up on those, um, yeah, two metres apart. So, look, I think there'll be all sorts of things that we can do as soon as we're allowed to do anything except go out to exercise. But... The next wave of rebellion was meant to be May the 5th, May the 2nd. Obviously, that didn't happen. We can't have mass rebellion. We can't do mass civil disobedience right now. But we're not resting. We're improving our networks, improving our mobilisation, um, joining up better around Australia and getting prepared. So this is, this is, again, some of just paint the streets in Melbourne. So 
there's been these giant posters, posters paint, pasted up and also just more like little house signs and things. It's a little house sign. This is me, my house signs. It's a really powerful thing just with your neighbours to declare your support for something strong like this. So you'll find out everything if you sign up at ozrebellion.earth. That way you'll get whatever newsletters are going. Um, the second one is if you actually really want to help us organise, you know, if you want to help plan, excuse me, paint the streets, that's the second one. You, you've got to try and get onto the base. In that you'll find like the groups, all the local groups, all the statewide organising, you find the art group, the media group, um, the flag making group, the Red Rebels, everything like that, that's all in the base. So that's number two there. And it's nice to sign up for the international one as well, because stuff is still, even in lockdown, it's still happening all around the world. And it's nice to get that newsletter. Thanks, I've Jane. Just, I've, 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 I've just... Um, Oh, sorry. I, I'm, we're we're pretty well out of time. We've run over okay. well over time already. So oh, I was thinking we had till nine thirty. Absolutely burning. And uh, no, we did advertise it as nine o'clock, but we're compromising, mm. Jane. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It's been it's been really good, uh, a new experience for many of us, and uh, and certainly a strong message. Is is there anything you wanted to to finish up a parting word before we um, make, make... Can say is that people who would like to go because it is late and I you know and I do want to say a big thank you to everyone for staying up this late on a cold evening when you're possibly already screened out. So look, thank you for everyone who came. And if there's anyone who'd like to stay around and 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 get a chance to ask more questions, that that you're very welcome. But yeah, why don't we sign off and let finish the recording and let people go? Well. I have got a couple of things to mention. First of yes, all, yes, that's what uh, I mean. That, that is that we uh, we do have a follow up event, and I'm going to put on one of our committee members, Alistair, to talk about that. Uh, Alistair, you're already unmuted. Yes. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if these ideas have uh, inspired you or made you anxious and worried, um, I suppose that's not the end of the world. Um, uh, no pun intended. So what I will suggest then is this. There is an event uh, that the humanists are putting on, a discussion event with Jim Crossway and I, where we'll have a chance to discuss climate anxiety and how humanism and humanist values directly engage uh, with climate issues. So if you're interested in engaging uh, with this issue more and continue this discussion, then please go on the website and we'll post a link. Uh, and if you have any ideas for other events, discussions on this issue or any other, please contact us on the committee. We're desperate to hear new ideas, um, although we've got lots in store. So yes, thank you very much for coming and this discussion does continue, it always will. Thanks, Alistair. No problem. Okay. Uh, put okay. back to Jane. For anyone who would like to leave the meeting, it's just that little red leave meeting down in your bottom right hand corner. And to those who are leaving, goodbye. Well, yes, and, and thank you for coming along thank and you. thanks for supporting Goodbye. our first big online event. We are planning more like it, so I hope you'll uh, recognise that we've learned a bit tonight and we'll, we'll keep learning and practice a bit more. Um, and just keep watching our websites, our Facebook, our Meetup. And uh, if you're a subscriber to our email, that'll be the easiest way to get things. Um, I, yeah, I'll let you go back to Jane now. Okay, so look, yeah, don't feel embarrassed about hitting leave because it's, you know, time to go to bed. But um, I've, I've just oh, actually, had... before we go, the, the last thing I usually do at the end of a talk, which we can't do, we can't do properly, but we go extinction and you go rebellion, even though you can't hear each other. And I go extinction and you go rebellion, rebellion. even though you can't hear each other. Mm -hmm. Get ready, I... you go rebellion. Thanks for thanks for coming. It's such a, it's so many people. It's been very exciting. Oh, there you go. I've got someone. I've got one person clapping. That's good. Thank you all. <laughs>